Okay, so we're going to start with El Guernica because it is an impressive piece of art made by Picasso, the very famous Picasso, of course. And his art is really a universal representation of struggle, of violence, of cruelty, which we're going to dissect, as Marilyn was saying. So let's start first. How did it all began? Because the Guernica was not something that all of a sudden Picasso said, well, I'm going to do this. Actually, it was a commission for the World's Fair in Paris, 1937. This is a very important World's Fair. All of the countries come together. They show their innovations, their art. But this time, Spain is divided. So the Spanish Republican government asked uh, Picasso, who is in Paris at the time, to create a mural for their pavilion. And this is how this became a thing. It was a commission for the pavilion of the Spanish Republican government. So what happened first is he had another idea. We don't know exactly what was his first original idea, but he read an article on the newspaper. Actually, it was an article on the Times, London Times, and the New York Times as well. And it was published on April 27. George Sear is going to be an eyewitness, and he's going to describe the account of the bombing of the Guernica. Guernica is a town in Spain, which we're going to see uh, what happened. And just to say a little, a, a little bit about it, uh, it says here, this eyewitness account, Guernica, the most ancient town of the Basques, at the center of their cultural tradition, was completely destroyed yesterday afternoon by insurgent air raiders. So who are these forces? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Actually, we have two different groups that are attacking each other, and they are fighting for the control of Spain. So the Republican forces is a chaotic, not very well organized army because it is a melange of communists, socialists, anarchists, and many other smaller groups that are against the, uh, the, the general, which is going to be the more, more, most important uh, man in Spain, which is General Francisco Franco, because he's going to become the dictator after he wins this war. So those are the nationalists. So nationalists against Republican forces. So these are the two groups that are fighting each other in Spain. And of course, the nationalists are going to be helped by the Germans. Remember 1933, we have Hitler already in power in Germany and Nazism is uh, very big uh, in 1937. So he's going to help out his friend Franco and he says German warplanes that are going to be the, the, the backbone of this struggle or this battle in Guernica. And they are going to send bombs into the town. Guernica is a, a place that it is, first of all, in the center of a crossroads uh, from different areas in the northern part of Spain, which is the Basque country. And this is between the, the, what happened during the civil, Spanish, I'm sorry, Spanish Civil War. And they destroyed completely the town. It's really terrible to see the photographs of that moment because it was market day. And first of all, let's talk a little bit about what's happening. All of the young men were out of the town. They were fighting the nationalist forces. So what the people who remain in town were the, the old people and women and children. And it was market day and it was packed. It was a crowded area. So when it was bombarded, they, it, they were unable to escape that inferno. It was, everything was destroyed. There was lots of fires around. All of the roads and the bridges were uh, destroyed as well. So there were not way, a way out of the town. And as I mentioned, Guernica is a, a very specific location, very strategic because it is a major crossroads near Bilbao. So Bilbao is a major city in, uh, in the north of Spain in the Basque country. But this is what happened. They destroyed everything, but lots of civilians died. In this, uh, in this moment. As you can see, some of the photographs of this, of this moment, uh, destruction, of course, of buildings, but the people who died in this, uh, in this attack were really uh, uh, terrible the way that they died. And uh, of course, all wars are terrible, but I mean, just attacking the center of this town where there was the marketplace and everybody was there, especially women with children, 
they were buying stuff, of course, at the marketplace and they died with that uh, attack. So, of course, Picasso reads this and he says, I have to do something to make the people aware of what is happening. So he starts drawing, of course, just based on that human inhumanity, that brutality and the hopelessness of war. What happens when a very powerful force attacks you and you are a civilian? So he starts by um, decomposing the, um, the body, the, um, also the expressions, and you have to see all of what he painted to understand the pain. But Picasso is very famous. Of course, we know that he's a painter, sculptor, printmaker, ceramist, stage designer, poet, and even a, a playwright. So he is known for being the co-founder of Cubism with George Braque. And he also invented some kind of a sculpture that is called constructed sculpture and also to use collage with also George Braque. But his two main paintings, uh, the most famous one, one of them is La Demoiselle d'Avignon, which was done in 1907. And 30 years later, we have El Guernica or the Guernica, if you want to translate it somehow. So what he is representing here is that uh, that moment when they are attacked, they are trying to run away from that moment. And the way that it is described is that the women and children make Guernica the image of innocent, defenseless humanity victimized. So this is what we see. That is why when we are in front of it, it seems that we understand their pain. They are people dying on the streets. They are uh, women crying out uh, for help the fire around the houses, the buildings, etc. And it is, of course, in the, the style of Picasso that we see this black and white, and of course, we have to say gray painting. So he started first doing some sketches. And look how he changes uh, over time, because he starts to draw from his own imagination of how he captures that moment. And the first thing that he does is first of all a bull because it is part of, of a small town. There is a countryside as well. People who have been uh, uh, who live there, but they want to go out of the house. For example, this uh, female figure coming out of here. Also, we see the horse who has been also probably is wounded or it's dead already. And look at this because there are several details that, of course, he did not put later in his final product like this small horse, horse with wings, because this horse symbolizes the soul probably of a baby inside the belly of this horse. And then the horse itself is on top of a body of a man who had died. And he also has this kind of a spear or lance. He probably was defending the townspeople or something and he died. But this is the beginning of that idea of that composition. And we have that instead of making, first of all, the whole body of this man, he breaks up the body in two. Not only that, but instead of putting this lance or this spear, he puts a sword or, or, or some kind of weapon that has been broken as well. Little by little, we see another sketch and we have already that Picasso is breaking up the whole composition in triangles, in squares, in his own style, of course. But there are several things that he's going to keep in some things that he's going to just, they're, go they're gonna disappear in the final composition. First of all, we see here, this uh, carriage wheel that is going to disappear. Also that horse that is kind of crooked and it's, uh, it's curved uh, and died uh, already uh, on that, on the bottom of that uh, wheel. Also, we're going to see some other things like the fire on one side, which he's going to abstract. And instead of just putting the fire, he puts somebody who's trying to get out of that fire and the whole building is on fire as well. Also, on the other side, we have another image, a woman who is crying and he, she's holding with her, her large hands, of course, uh, probably her husband who's, who's dead on the floor. And he's going to change that. So instead of putting that man, he's going to add a baby, which of course it is much more dramatic 
than her husband. Also, we see that he's going to change into something more and more dramatic. So it's not as uh, forward as we would like in the respect as a figurative painting, but it is forward because it is representing uh, death, it is representing pain, struggle, and cruelty. We have that it is, it looks like a room, so the scene, it seems like it is a closed area because there are several things like this bulb here, like this light on this area right here. But all of a sudden we see other things because we see a house burning. So are we inside? Are we outside? So we are really uncertain of where are we standing. Also, it is more and more dramatic because he uses black, white and gray. So there's the absence of color that makes it more dramatic. Like we're watching something that is not exactly real, but we see it as we would see uh, a black and white movie. So also it adds the somber mood that we find through the pain and the chaos of this painting. Another image that we find here is the bull. So it also is um, the symbol of the surrealist. And Picasso, even though he was not part of the surrealist movement, he was uh, an acquaintance of them and he knew about them. And for some reason, uh, he was inspired by them. He, and at some point in his life and his career, he changes his style because he was in contact with the surrealists. So the Minotaur, uh, which is translated, of course, uh, as a symbol of the surrealists and also the labyrinth, uh, the Minotaur, of course, and the legend of the Minotaur is going to be a symbol of the surrealists. So he includes that. Also, bullfighting is important in Spain, or at least it used to be in the 1930s, not anymore as much as it was before. But uh, the bull is always around the pastures of Spain. So it is the symbol of Spain, at the same time, the combination of surrealism and his own, of course, love of bullfighting, because he was really, uh, lo he loved bullfighting. So we find here on your right, just a painting of René Magritte, one of the surrealists who paints this skull of the Minotaur. But we have to concentrate in different elements and different details. So he's approaching abstraction because he's using figurative painting, but at the same time, he makes it much more schematic and much more geometric, but it's a very complex narrative, all of it. And as uh, Marilyn said, it, it is very, very large. So when we are in front of it, we see everything and then we see all of the different elements that are part of this composition. The painting is on canvas and is very, very powerful. It is an anti-war painting and it becomes a universal symbol of anti-war. So the suffering of people is represented here, but not only the people, but the animals as well. What happens when there is a war and there's a lot of violence and a lot of chaos? And when it was finished, actually, it's going to become part of a world tour because they wanted, and it's going to be used as propaganda to have the people acknowledge what's happening in Spain and the Spanish Civil War. So it's going to be political propaganda to help the Republicans. And we find that the whole composition, as complex as it is, we see all of the different things that are happening here. And in that side on the left side that I just show you, we see this woman, woman that this woman that is looking upwards, she's crying and you feel her pain. The bull stands over that woman. She's really grieving because her child is dead. She is holding him as she is in pain. And the bull on the back is kind of looking to one side. Look, look how different the bull in the sketch was much more naturalistic, of course. And when he has the final product, it is much more simplified, schematized, but also the expression becomes human. And she is uh, kind of talking to the bull or crying to the bull somehow. So on this, in the center of this composition, we see the horse. And let me show you the detail of the, the face of the horse, first of all. So there is kind of a dagger instead of, a, of the tongue or the dagger is piercing the tongue. The horse is falling in agony. He is dying. And then we find that light bulb, bulb on the top part. 
it has the shape of an evil eye. Also, if we translate a light bulb in Spanish, usually they say bombilla or bombillo, and it has a similar uh, or is the same as bomba in Spanish, also bomb in English. So of course, there, is a, there are a lot of interpretations about this. Also, it has been interpreted as the sun. Uh, so it's a combination of the artificial light with natural light, going back to where we are standing as viewers. We are uncertain of where are we. Are we in an open space? Is it an interior uh, scene? What is it really? And also in the bottom of that central area, we find this man, this man that is broken in pieces. So we find on one side, the head and one hand. On the other side, the hand just grabbing that part of that sword. And all of a sudden, there is something, something that allows us to see some kind of hope because we see here on the bottom part, a flower. So it's kind of uh, the idea of hope. So the, 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 the sword is shattered, it's broken, but then all of a sudden we see that there is this small flower. Also, uh, this man is under the horse. So we have to think about that, uh, the same as the, the example that we saw before. But the detail of the hand, the open hand also Re resembles the stigmata or the symbol of the martyrdom of Christ. So they are martyrs, they die for their country. In this case, we find uh, other uh, um, sketches that he made like this one of how to paint or how to represent the, um, the, the hand of this man with that broken sword. The whole composition has, as I mentioned, different areas. And here on this detail, we see this ghost-like figure coming out of that window. And uh, we don't see the body. We only see this large arm coming out as well. We assume it's part of her. And she is the eyewitness to what is happening uh, around her. And she's, of course, frightened. Look at the expression. And that hand as well has some kind of a candle. And also, it's probably a symbol of hope. As uh, I mentioned, the light bulb, there is a juxtaposition with the bulb and the candle. So artificial, the sun probably, and then the light bulb, all of the three lights in different ways in the same uh, canvas. On this side, we have a man who or, or woman, we really don't know, but a figure that is asking for help, actually crying for help, because he is burning inside of that house. There is an open door or window in the back, and on top of it, we can still see the flames and also beside him. The other part, what I made for you, is to put color in each one of the parts, because the way that Picasso did it, it is for us to try to see different uh, planes in the same painting. So we see the, the, uh, the bull, but it's very hard for us to understand where the body is. So I put color on some of them so you can see where each one of those figures, each one of those objects are. So for example, we find here the bull, then we see here the woman with her child with her baby. On the center, we see the horse with, of course, his four legs and the whole body. But look how he broke, uh, Picasso broke all of the images. And then we see here on the bottom part, that man that was, of course, in two parts. We all see the hand on one side and the head with the hand on the other side. Then this woman who's running to, towards the other side, she's running who knows where. And then we find, of course, the other two figures, one with the fire and the ghost-like figures. So somebody uh, in an interview wanted Picasso to explain Guernica, and this is his answer. This is a bull, is a bull, and this horse is a horse. If you give a meaning to certain things in my paintings, it may be true, but it's not my idea to give this meaning. What ideas and conclusions you have got, I obtain too, but instinctively, unconsciously. I make the painting for the painting. I paint the objects 
for what they are. So he never explained any of it. And he would say, it is enough to the painter to define the symbols. Otherwise, it would be better if he wrote them out in so many words. The public who look at the picture must interpret the symbols as they understand them. So that is why there are several interpretations, but what you feel when you are in front of it is exactly the same because people see what he intended to do, to represent people dying, people struggling, people in pain. So I wanted you to see this comparison to a painting done by Leonardo da Vinci, The Battle of Anghiari. He never finished it. So we have only designs and sketches made by other artists because it was a fresco and it was covered because he never finished it. So he was working for, in it for seven years and there's a lot of documentation of it. So we find here that there is a battle scene. So we find also horses, people with different expressions and they are fighting the, uh, the, 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 between each other. What I want you to see is the comparison with the horses, because here we find that Da Vinci was observing how a horse reacts in a battle scene. They really don't understand what's happening. And for them, it is also uh, an attack. So it is the representation of horses that we find the same because an animal instinctively is going to react. And Da Vinci is going to be interested in representing the moments of aggression and how an animal actually reacts in that moment. The same as Picasso did in his own way and in his own style. So we find here that Da Vinci is going to make several sketches for the Battle of Anghiari to capture the expressions not only of the animals, but also of the men and how a man is going to react the same way as an animal with that expression so strong and we find uh, some of his sketches, but also some paintings done by other people, some of his pupils and artists like Rubens that also were inspired by the paintings by Leonardo da Vinci. So he's going to paint not only uh, horses, but also lions, dragons, fantastical animals like this one, and battle scenes between them and how those opposing forces react, how they shout, how they cry, how they die even. So we find that that idea of aggression, it is found also in Guernica. We have that the Battle of Anghiari, we have many versions done by different artists. This is the one of the most famous one. It is called Tavola Doria. So we find that it's a cluster where there is a close combat between the two armies and it's very monumental and dramatic. So we have actually more people here uh, that are battling between them. And I'm showing you the version done by Rubens. So those are uh, the, the people who are represented here are mercenaries from Milan against the Florentine who are defending their city. And look how the, uh, the shouts, the cries, and even the contorted bodies of those fighters are resembling this instinct. And we find here that Da Vinci is going to represent them in that chaotic moment of a battle scene. So we find that um, the comparison with the, the, the painting by El Guernica is very different in the, in, the, in the idea of the representation by Leonardo da Vinci is representing the two enemies attacking each other. And in El Guernica, we don't have an enemy. We don't have anybody that we can see. The enemy already is gone. They are attacking, but they are attacking from the, the air. So of course, we don't see the enemy. The enemy is everywhere, but we don't see it in the composition. We find that Da Vinci is going to represent in different sketches how the expression of people who are angry, who are attacking, there is an effort and they have distorted faces. We find that the cry in the painting of the Guernica is of pain, of what can I do? My baby is dead. So we find that a lot of uh, things that are similar, but also the expressions are a little bit different. In, on the bottom part where the horses are, we also see a small image of two figures here. 
And uh, the, the idea here that I want you to see is that they are also represented people who are behind or beneath the horses. But in the case of El Guernica, we find somebody who is dead already. He, has, he was fighting. We don't see, we see the, um, the sword that was broken, but he's dead. Actually, he has been decapitated and he is fragmented. He's broken up in pieces. We also have here uh, an image of the same uh, man who is being attacked. Wait a second, uh, right here. And I tried to cut it so you can see only the image of the horse on top of the man who is dead. When we see in our history, the moments when artists feel free to represent somebody in pain, usually we go to the last judgment representation like this, like this one by Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck represented the underworld or hell as people here are dying, I'm sorry, they're dead, but uh, they are uh, in pain, they are tortured and, I'm sorry? And this is the only moment when we find that people, uh, I'm sorry, artists are going to represent um, uh, the, the, the struggle or the pain of men, the contorted bodies. So we only have that example, one of the examples of the last judgment, but every time that we find last judgment representations is where we find the most freedom in painting throughout art history until the 19th century actually. And we find that in the paintings by, uh, by um, Picasso, Leonardo, I'm sorry, uh, Picasso made in El Guernica, this uh, representation of somebody who is in pain. And it feels like this torture, again, contorted bodies, expression, opening their mouth, asking for help, etc. So we have more or less that same idea in that, those representations of hell and the last judgment. In Goya's representation, for example, this that it's called the shipwreck in the uh, early 19th century, we have more also some examples of people that are asking for help. Like this one here that uh, we find this woman with her arms uh, raised uh, and asking for help because everybody else is dying. It is a shipwreck and she does know, not know what to do at that point. Here we have a comparison with uh, Goya's painting. We also have that Goya had a whole series of painting called Disasters of War, the Desastres de la Guerra, after the French invasion. And this series uh, was part of, of a whole project that he had that was never shown. Actually, those are engravings and he has uh, expressions of what happens in during war. Here we have people running from one place to the other, trying to go away from the fighting. Also, we have some other examples of people being attacked. So there are several um, things, several, several examples of Goya. And this one, for example, is called the flesh eating vulture. So instead of putting a king or the army itself, he puts a monster, this flesh eating vulture, that is, is, of course, in this case, the townspeople are chasing him out of it. Uh, but it is a gigantic bird, it's a monster that has been attacking them. All of those engravings are his observations of people who are escaping, for example, here from the fire. And his observation of what happens uh, at war. One of the famous paintings that we have also by Goya is the 2nd of May. So this was a popular uprising. They are coming from the Royal Palace to the Puerta del Sol in Madrid. And uh, the Mamelukes, who were Turkish mercenaries, are going to fight as well here. And Ferdinand, who was uh, the Spanish, um, the, the, the one who was, was going to inherit the, inherit the, tr the throne, He's going to force his parents to abdicate. And what happened is that Joseph Bonaparte, the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, he's going to be the king at that moment. And afterwards, of course, uh, Ferdinand is going to come back 
and uh, Joseph Bonaparte is going to go out of Spain. But the whole painting is about this moment, this popular uprising, and there's a lot of movement. And there is this uh, idea of a, a thrust from one side to the other because they are uh, fighting each other, but they are coming from the Royal Palace to the Puerta del Sol. So there is a movement of the people from one side to the other. But look also of this expression of the people, first of all, the mercenaries, the Turkish mercenaries, the Mamluks, the French soldiers as well, some of the people who have escaped from jail and the expressions of the horses. They have fear. They are in this crowd as they are being attacked as well. And they are attacking people at the same time. So there is a representations of war, of attacks, of uh, uprisings, but ne never we have seen a representation of the victims, just as victims, but in that moment, specific moment, because we're gonna see that there are other examples of victims, but not exactly as Picasso did it. But it is a cluster of people. There is a perspective in Goya's painting and in Picasso's painting, we don't have perspective anymore. We don't have a focal point. There is an array of different elements and objects and it seems chaotic in a different way. Also, we find a horse that it is on top of a man that also has been uh, attacked and it's dead. You have a detail here. So you find that there is an interpretation, a very, very um, realistic interpretation of dead and uh, people fighting each other and the anger and what happens through uh, war. And I want to point out this painting by Jericho. Theodore Jericho was very famous at the beginning of the 19th century. And this is one of the famous paintings that he made. It's called The Raft of the Medusa. It's a very large painting at the Louvre Museum. And it is about a shipwreck. It is a shipwreck scene and actually it happened, but it is part of the romantic movement, this kind of representation. So the name Medusa comes from the name of the, the, the ship where they were. Uh, it was called Medus and actually ran aground off the coast of today's Mauritania in July 2nd, 1816. So two years afterwards, um, uh, Jericho feels the need to paint this moment. And what we find here is that there is a comparison with Guernica because we find, first of all, the muted colors. But not only that, it is not a war scene. It's people suffering, trying to survive in this raft. So there is uh, some similarities. And let me tell you a little bit more about this painting and what, this moment, because what we know of those people who survived, actually 15 only survived from 147 that got on the raft, and they were rescued after 13 days on that raft. So they died, most of them from starvation, dehydration, and actually people are going to eat each other. After they died, uh, they're gonna be so hungry that it's gonna be also, they are gonna practice cannibalism. So it was a terrible, terrible account, and it is an uncommissioned work. This is an, an oil sketch. So he made a lot of research. He actually went to the morgue, he visited hospitals, he gathered uh, sketches from all over. Uh, we see that he also took some uh, limbs and bodies from the morgue, as you find some of the sketches that he made because he wanted to see how a body decomposes. Also, he's going to visit some hospitals with mentally ill people, and he's going to also paint them because he sees how people also react in a very different way when we are not in, our, in all of our senses. So these are some of the paintings. And people that are uh, plague victims on the streets uh, also. So we have a lot of sketches that Jericho made during this time before he started to paint his famous composition of the Raft of the Medusa. He even got obsessed with the stiffness of the corpses. And we have a lot of sketches like this one and final uh, paintings, the compositions of only limbs like this one uh, that he started to make as studies. And then he became really obsessed with them about the skin decay of the, the whole corpse, how 
it, it develops when it is uh, already dead. Like this uh, severed head who actually was borrowed from a lunatic asylum and he stored it in his studio roof to paint it over the days and how it was decomposing. The body was decomposing and how to paint it. Uh, so we have several of them because he was studying them for that. And also he was very interested in, into uh, what happened and what really happened in that account. So he interviewed some of the survivors and three of them, uh, Henri Savagny, um, he was a surgeon. So those three that I'm going to mention are the ones who he interviewed. Alexander Correa was an engineer and both are going to give them emotional descriptions of what happened. Imagine being 13 days and just trying to survive somehow. One of the survivors was a carpenter, Laviette, and he constructed an ex, an, a scale model, an exact replica uh, in scale, of course, uh, smaller, of the raft so he could figure out how to paint it. So Jericho is going to have also some his own sketches, the cannibalism that happened, and he's going to uh, decide not to paint the moment when people are eating each other, like this um, study that he made. Actually, uh, this is what he's going to decide to do. So this, um, one of the, the, um, the survivors is a, uh, one African crew member, uh, Jean Charles, who spotted uh, the, uh, the boat uh, who's going to rescue them. And he's waving his handkerchief. In, of course, this is the, uh, the light that is in this horizon which symbolizes hope. The painting itself is, has a lot of tension. And the ship, which was called Argus, just saw them by chance. Uh, they were not looking for them. Argo, the, the, that uh, boat was only there by chance and he, they saw them and they're gonna rescue them, of course. So the whole composition has a diagonal that crosses um, in the center of it almost. But look how also he's going to balance the composition because the raft is going the other way and we have the masts on the other side, but the whole perspective goes to one way, of course, and look at the focal point or the, the uh, vanishing point on one side. The uh, representation here actually is very dramatic as well because what he chose to do are those menacing waves to add more drama. And we know from those accounts that the rescue day was very calm and sunny, but he chooses to do this dramatic scene of that specific moment. The structure of the composition is with two triangles or two pyramids as we find here in this uh, representation. And then we have that the whole representation is really very impressive. The models that he used, some of them were his friends, like the painter, Eugene Delacroix, which we see right here. Also the three witnesses, the three survivors that are right there, Corrad, Savigny, and Laviette. And the, his assistant is this corpse right here, Jamar. So Jamar is painted here and we don't see his face. He's dead already painted here. Uh, let me show you this, this study that he made, this sketch that he made. Uh, so the, the face is on the water, as you find here. Uh, so he just represented this body uh, as he's just floating there, but nobody really cares because they're all so tired. They're starving, they're struggling, they're suffering. And this is what we find. So he's going to do a theatrical scene. And it took him a long time to complete this painting, around 18 months. So he's going to show it at this salon, at the Paris Salon. It's going to be very controversial. And it's a very new style. So this is the beginning of romanticism uh, in a very dramatic form. The whole composition seems like it's coming out of the canvas. And let me show you here this photograph so you can see how large it is. And there is a thrust also that's coming outside. It looks like it's coming out of that composition of that canvas. And I'm showing you this because of those expression, the despair, the, this man who 
has the corpse of his son, but he's really not thinking about anything anymore. And probably Jericho was inspired by Henri Fuseli, who painted Dante's Infer Inferno and Ugolino, who's going to actually be in prison with his sons and they're gonna die and he's going to eat them after they die. So he's going to also uh, uh, commit uh, cannibalism. And we can compare it in that respect and the idea of despair, struggle, pain, suffering, etc. And all of a sudden there is some kind of hope, but this is a struggle uh, on sur for survival, the same as we see in Guernica's painting. I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to talk about a painting in particular of victims of war. And this is by Eugène Delacroix. It is called The Massacre at Chios. Eugène Delacroix, as I mentioned, he was a friend also of Jericho. And he has his own interpretation of wartime. So he's representing here the horror of a war, the destruction, the seas, death, and all of the, the foreground is uh, crowded with suffering characters. Also, we find some of the military um, figures and the people who are the victims, they have those vacant gazes, they are empty. They're looking somewhere that we don't know exactly what they're looking at. And he's going to uh, represent it the, the, instead of that moment when they are attacked, this is afterwards. This is the aftermath of an attack they're victims, but they are going to be killed. So there's not an, any heroic figure. There's no hope, there's despair. We find here are some of the details. So on your right, you have one member of the Ottoman forces as they're going to attack in the uh, back. Also, we find uh, the scene of a battle scene here. Uh, let me show you here. Uh -huh. So um, for, the, 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 the numbers are really terrible because we find that from 70,000 surviving inhabitants, they were all forced for deportation into slavery. And from them, uh, from the citizens, uh, around 20,000 people died uh, in Kios only. So there's the, uh, the battle in the, uh, in the background and also the smoke and even the uh, Mediterranean Sea on the back. So the horizon and the sky, the cloud is sky as well. The composition is also uh, divided in two. And we have on one side, a lot of movement, dynamism. And on the other one is more still uh, rigid people who are looking into their destiny. They're gonna be killed. So we find that also Delacroix is going to have lots of research and uh, he's going to try to find out how somebody looks after they died and look at the bones, uh, the structure of the face, also how the body decomposes. The same as Jericho, he's going to try to have research with uh, people in hospitals and in the morgue. So we find that Picasso in his own style is representing also that struggle, that suffering of the people. Uh, the horse, again, it is a symbol of that force, but in Picasso, the horse is also a victim. He's dying as well. And we find that there are some differences, of course. So the soldiers here in the painting by the Lacroix are in the shadows. We find that the 13 civilians that are in the foreground, they are just waiting. They're going for their enslavement, enslavement or probably they're gonna be slaughtered. Even uh, we see on the right corner, a baby who is just on top of her of his mother's uh, corpse. There is a vertical, uh, this is a silhouette, and there is a vertical thrust from that area looking upwards into that horse, the rampant horse, and probably a representation of this evil military man uh, with a Turkish turban. So we find that um, each one of those uh, painters are going to have a lot of studies and research like this two, uh, one head of a woman and the other one, a girl seated in a cemetery. How do you look in, in this expression of despair, of suffering, of a, va a vacant gaze? 
The same as Jericho, we have a structure, a, py a pyramid structure, uh, but a little bit different because we have the center area where it opens up in uh, the Lacrosse painting and you find the battle scene and even the smoke in the back and the horizon of the Mediterranean Sea. Guernica is also, it, it also has a structure. So it is divided in the center. So that is why we have a whole um, intersecting of lines all around that it has a shape of a pyramid as well. If you look closely, you find that there are segments that are dividing all of the different places. So we find this, each one of those figures in each one of those uh, uh, segments or each one of those uh, places in this composition. Also, we find that here in the Lacrosse painting, there is a center, as we can see also the horizon, which also we find a triangular shape, but a little bit different, of course, from the one that Picasso was using. So if we compare both of them, both of them have triangles in both of them, we can see it. The other one in the Lacrosse uh, painting, we have the triangle upside down, so a little bit different. We have some photographs that uh, Dora Maar, his lover, uh, made of the progress of this painting. So it's amazing to see how he's, go he's going to fragment the composition and each one of those figures. Look at the bowl right there, which is still uh, full and we don't see the horse in this representation yet. Uh, we have part of the horse, I don't know if you can see it right here, and some of the bodies also here. Here he does not decide yet what he's going to do with this figure. So little by little we see how he's going to continue. And as he worked on the mural, he said, the Spanish struggle is the fight of reaction against the people, against freedom. My whole life as an artist has been nothing more than a continuous struggle against reaction and the death of art. How could anybody think for a moment that I could be in agreement with reaction and death? In the panel on which I am working, which I shall call Guernica, and in all my recent works of art, I clearly express my abhorrence of the military case which has sunk, sunk Spain in an ocean of pain and death. So we find that little by little, those photographs allows us to see the development of his painting. So we have another one right here. And then we have more of those, uh, of those photographs that allows us to see the progress of this painting. Dora Mar, I mentioned she was uh, his lover. He, she was a photographer and also a painter. And she's the one who uh, made all of those pictures. She was a surrealist artist, as you find some of her photographs right here, her self-portrait and another photograph on your right. And he painted her as well. She was his lover at the same time as Marie-Therese Walter. Both of them were miserable <laughs> at the same time. This is one of the paintings that he does of Dora Mar. But what happened in that pavilion, he was not the only one who was commissioned to make a painting. Also, Jean Miró was commissioned to make his own for the Spanish pavilion of the 1937 Paris International Exhibition. And this was called The Reaper. Jean Miró made this painting and Alexander Calder, who was also a friend of them, he's going to make the Mercury Fountain. The three of those uh, art pieces are going to be displayed at the pavilion of the Spanish Republic. And this painting by uh, Jean Miro was donated, of course, to the Republic. It was a large piece of work, a uh, piece of art, and it was split into six different component uh, panels. It was packed for shipping. They're gonna, they were going to ship it back to Valencia and somehow it was lost. So we don't know exactly what happened to it. That painting was lost and probably would have been a rival to the Guernica. We really do not know exactly how it looked. We only have those photographs to show of this painting that Miro made. What we do have, and this is actually at the Museum of Joan Miro in Barcelona, is the uh, fountain that Calder made, the Mercury, fu uh, the Mercury Fountain. And it was a memorial to the siege of Almaden. Almaden was attacked by Franco's troop, by the nationalists, 
And Almaden was an important supplier of mercury. Actually, 60% of the world's mercury was supplied by Almaden. So it is full of mercury. Today, it is uh, all surrounded by glass. You cannot go near it because we know mercury can be dangerous to your health. But Almaden was represented here because of that attack. Another painting that was done at the same time as El Guernica is this one by Max Ernst. Max Ernst made the Angel of Heart and Home, uh, and he's going to retitle it The Triumph of Surrealism. He painted this as a monster, uh, the menace of fascism, this destructive potential of a powerful force against mankind, and mankind is defendless. So it is representing also the angel of death or the beast unleashed at the end of days. It is a representation of a composite, a composite uh, figure with uh, hands that look like also uh, paws and a horse-like uh, face, but it not really is a horse. And it, he's acting like a, a human walking, but with different elements surrounding him in a desolate landscape. Also, uh, Max Ernst is going to create this for the exhibition uh, of the Surrealists. And he's going to say about it, the fireside angel is a picture I painted after the defeat of the Republicans in Spain. This is, of course, an ironical title for a kind of clumsy oath, which destroys everything that gets in the way. That was my impression in those days of the things that might happen in the world. And I was right, because of course we know that World War II started afterwards. So it is a contemporary of Guernica and it is related to the Guernica because it's related to the Spanish war. Also related to the engraving by Goya, Francisco Goya and the disasters of war. This is uh, the example of this monster that probably was an inspiration for Max Ernst. And not only that, but also this film, The Lost World, that uh, we see here kind of a dinosaur who's going to attack a man who is right here in this area hiding be uh, behind that tree. So the idea of a monster attacking a defenseless man. So, there are other artists who are going to portray war, like Jose Clemente Orozco, and it's called Catharsis. Jose Clemente Orozco painted his own representation of war, destruction, in also using uh, this, the muralist style, uh, the Mexican muralist uh, muralism, and the, also for shortening of the bodies, all of those scores so that he uses machinery and fire which is a, a little bit different from what El Guernica is uh, representing, but it is the same idea of people dying. Picasso is going to make another painting called the Charnel House with no colors using also uh, black, white, and gray. And the Charnel House is an ossuary, a depository of bones. So it is about uh, dead and also torture and pain. Also, we find this is an ossuary, as you can see here at the Charnel House, with all of the bones uh, that are just in uh, one pit or one area. And a little different is this one, which I wanted you to see because there is a lot of things that he took from El Guernica from that painting. This painting, which he did a little bit uh, before, it's called the Crucifixion. This painting was never sold. He never wanted to sell it. And it is representing Christ and Mary Magdalene, and also the crucifixion. So in the center, we have the actual crucifixion, Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene in white, representing purity and spirituality. Then there's black behind, which is the contrast with darkness over the land. And all of the yellow that surrounds it is representing here the gold of those medieval icons, representing also pain and despair that he is going to do again later in El Guernica. So it's not that he invented this way uh, of, of painting with the Guernica, but it is a development of his style already. So El Guernica was done seven years after this crucifixion. Uh, so the crucifixion also is, has some resemblance to altar pieces, like this one here by Grunewald, and it's called the Isenheim uh, altarpiece. 
Where do you find here Mary Magdalene uh, begging and also the Virgin begging and the crucifixion, which is represented here in this area, also in a form in an abstract way, uh, elongating the hands and almost uh, disappearing the figure. So this is Mary Magdalene. And also we find that Mary Magdalene is right here, trying, of course, begging uh, for help or praying. Also, we find that uh, some of the things are come from the New Testament. The two soldiers who are rolling the dice for Jesus' tunic, this comes from the Gospels. You have a detail here of them. And the same as we find in Gustave Doré's erection of the cross, where we find the, uh, the soldiers uh, playing the game to get the, uh, the tunic that belonged to Jesus Christ. Then we find the um, representation of Dismas and, Jes and Gestas or Gestas, who are the thieves who were crucified alongside, and we find their crosses right here. And again, we find some of the symbols, like the sponge uh, that was soaked in vinegar that was offered to Jesus Christ for his wounds. Uh, and also we find here, uh, it looks like the Quixote, but it's Longinus piercing the body of Jesus Christ. And then we find also here that Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea is taking down the body of Jesus Christ. And the ladder is also a symbol of the passion of Jesus Christ. We have a narrative and we have to know how to read this passage of time. So with the beginning, we have all of those different elements that are happening at the same time. And then we find that they offer the sponge. Then we see they take down the bodies of, of, um, of the two thieves. And then we have the uh, Longinus piercing Jesus Christ's body. And afterwards we see Joseph of Arimathea taking down the body. So there is a narrative and there is the uh, representation of that cry, of that um, despair, also the pain, the, uh, the people who are burning and asking for help or just praying for help. So uh, the first public appearance of, of, uh, of, the, of the Guernica was in Paris in 1937, but afterwards they took it to different places. Uh, so Rosenberg was the art dealer who represented Picasso and he organized a Scandinavian tour in 1938 also with other works, not only by Picasso, but also by Brack and by Matisse. Then it traveled to England and to France. And in September, 1939, uh, it was at the San Francisco Museum of Art. They wanted to raise funds, of course, and support for the Spanish refugees. So we find that during the war, uh, Picasso was surveilled by the Nazis. And when they came into his house, uh, when they occupied Paris, a German officer saw the photo of Ergenica in his apartment and he asked, did you do that? And Picasso re responded, no, you did. Of course, referring to the attack of the town of Guernica, not the painting itself. So El Guernica is going to be given to the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, with an extended loan. And he said that it should not return to Spain until democratic liberties were restored in his country. And that is exactly what happened. El Guernica was restored and returned to Spain, first to the Casón del Buen Retiro in 1981. And today, uh, well, this is just a tapestry that is at the UN. Let me just go ahead here. And today is, uh, is shown in, uh, in the museum in Madrid. So it's a powerful symbol. It's a warning uh, of humanity against the suffering devastation of the war. But there's not a specific reference to El Guernica, to Guernica the town, because it becomes a universal, a timeless topic. And this is a very, very powerful image. And there is, it's a cityscape, a nightmarish representation, all of those forces that are attacking the individual. And Picasso believed that art can actually contribute towards freedom. So he made this Guernica, you can see how large it is. And today is displayed in Madrid at the Reina Sofia Museum. 1992, when it opened, it was open to, for everybody to see it and to admire it and at least 
to understand part of the struggle of war. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed today's class. Okay, so uh, let me just